don't have any problem standing up and speaking out for my Lord. I'm telling you, he's done something for each one of us. He ought to give us an opportunity. So when an opportunity does come up, we ought to be willing to stand and give, uh, stand and teach, stand and proclaim, whatever. You know what a preacher simply is? It's a proclaimer, somebody that proclaims God's word. And we want to all be ready to do that because of what God has done for us. I was thinking over in Romans uh, chapter number 12 where the apostle Paul says, we won't be going there, but I want you to uh, know this passage of scripture. He says, I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. And this is what Paul was saying, in light of what God's done for you, can I, got, uh, can I, can I say something to you mo this morning? He's done something for you nobody else could. Hey, he's done something for you nobody else would. I don't care who they are. Nobody else would have done what he done. He done something for us. In light of what he's done, we ought to all be willing to give our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him. And here's what the, here's what the Bible teaches us, which is our reasonable service. Don't think you've went out on a limb and said, well, I've just done above and beyond. No, that's just your reasonable service. Hey, Christ died for you. What's your response to that? Your response ought to be to die, die for him. You say, David, God wants us to, to die. No, he don't want us to die physically. He wants us to be living sacrifices. Here's what he's saying to you and I this morning. He wants you to lay your body down and say, God, here I am. Take me, use me for your honor and your glory. And I'm going to be honest with you, he's not going to force you to do that. He's not going to force me to do that. He wants us to do that freely. He wants us to lay ourselves down. Let me ask you this question this morning before we get started. What are you laying down? Huh? What are you giving up for the Lord? I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about what he's given up for us this morning. As I was thinking about what, uh, I didn't have a whole lot of time to think about it, and I'm not one of these preachers, uh, Garrett, Kenny, some of these other guys, Daddy, some of these other preachers that just have, um, have all, these, all these messages. Like Blake, he's got a whole, I started to go down and get in his study last night and just see if I could ramble through there and find one that I could kind of go off of. I didn't do that. I didn't break in there. But I began to sit down and I just said, God, what would you have me to say this morning? You know who's going to be there. Hey, got news for you. God's not surprised you showed up this morning. God's not surprised Blake's not here this morning. God knew exactly what was going to happen before, he, before we ever even got here. So, I, hey, God's, God's in control of this thing, not me. So I began to pray and seek God's face. Here's the, here's the cool part about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. We've been in this thing now with my D group or my disciple group. You'll hear a lot about that, hear us talk a lot about that. Um, over the over the next, I don't know, you probably hear a lot about of it right now, and you're thinking, what is all this disciple stuff going on? Uh, I have a group of guys I meet with every week. We've been doing this for going on seven months now. It's me and four other men. Every Monday we meet. And we've walked through the Word of God together since August. And we've come all the way through the Old Testament. And here's what we've done. We've, we've read from Genesis all the way through Malachi, and now we've started into the New Testament together. We'll meet on Mondays, and here's what will happen. They'll look at me, and I'll look at them, and I'll say, so how's your journaling this week? How have you been in the Word of God this week? Have you been reading? Have you been studying? Where are you at? Let's see, where you, let's see what kind of progress you've made. And what it's done is it's held me accountable to stay in God's Word. You know what I've found over the years? Every time I try to read through God's Word, and I'm just kind of alone doing it myself, I get through about, I don't know, Genesis, Exodus, and boy, I hit Leviticus. And it's like, what just happened? You know what I'm saying? We've been reading that this past week at home through the church reading Bible, Bible reading plan. I hope you're doing that. Like, give us a Bible reading plan. I hope you're doing that. Maybe you're doing a different plan. I don't know, but we're doing that as a family. And, and well, me and Evie uh, are doing that uh, mostly. No, I'm just kidding. Where's Marla? She may have went down. But anyways... Uh, we can say, well, one to them, can't we? So uh, unless she's in the nursery, then she's seeing this. But um, so a lot of times it'll end up with just me and Evie. We'll be in there, and, and Elin, she's running around somewhere doing something, probably on Instagram or something. I don't know. But, but we'll open up the Bible, and we'll just begin to read God's Word together out loud. And uh, I've, took the, I've took the brunt of it here lately because I've got the Old Testament, and Evie gets the New Testament and Psalms. So I've been reading through the book of Leviticus. And you want to talk about 
monotonous. You want to talk about just trudging through and then they brought the ram in and they brought a bull in and they done this and they touched his horn and they put blood on the right earlobe and they put blood on the right thumb. They put blood on the right toe and, and, and they went and did this. They slaughtered it. They cut it up. They pulled its fat out. They done all this stuff and it's just over and over and over. We got into about the 14th chapter and you know what I've realized in doing that? God's serious about sin. God's serious about sin. We're living in a day today where we don't think God is serious about sin. Well, God understands what I'm going through. God don't understand what you're going through. God's serious about sin. He's not going to make an exception for you, for me, or anybody else. If God said it was wrong then, it's still wrong now. I'm telling you, the, the, the good part about all of this is we don't have to go to the priest anymore. They don't have to kill a bull or a lamb. We're going to be coming out of the book of Hebrews, chapter number 4. And I want you to look for just a few minutes at a couple of verses of Scripture. And I hope this will bless your heart. Talking about our great high priest. This is just in our personal reading time. I'll be, I sat down last night and I thought, okay, God, I get an opportunity to preach. Uh, I follow this, uh, I follow this uh, person on Facebook. It's called Honest Youth Pastor. And he always puts something funny on there, and there's always some kind of funny something or another he puts up there. But he's talking about, usually he's talking about when the, when the preacher gives the youth pastor the opportunity to preach. I mean, you know, we take advantage of it. So when I come down last night, I thought, bless God, I'm always talking to kids. Not this morning. I get, I get a group full of, a, 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 of attentive adults. Young people, they're thumbing through their phones. They're, 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 they're looking at their shoes. I mean, like Brady's doing right now. And, they're, you know, there's very, very little attention. I'm kidding, Brady. Very little attention uh, to what you're talking about, what you're doing. So I'm thinking, boy, I get an opportunity this morning to, to, to really speak to some adults. It's going to be attentive. What could I say that would just blow their mind? And God said, it ain't about you blowing anybody's mind. It's about what I say. It's about what I've got to say. So I calmed myself down a little bit, and I sat down, and I said, okay, God, who part about reading your Bible every day? Is you're like, like, like Paul was when he talked to young Timothy, and he said, be instant in season, out of season. You always got something to talk about. <laughs> always got something to talk about. Why? Because you've been reading God's Word. I want to be honest with you. I've read through the whole Old Testament. i got plenty to talk about when somebody wants to talk about the Bible. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Well, the Bible says this. The Bible says that. Our problem is today most Christians ain't read enough Bible that they could stand and say anything. So I hope it ain't, uh, I hope it ain't indicative of our church. I hope you're in God's Word. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture to us this morning. Three verses, and i got three points. I told Garrett this morning, even not being a preacher, how, how Blake must have, uh, he's just got us all in this this mode. So when I, I said, okay, God, what do you want me to say? And he, and he took me to this passage of Scripture. I immediately looked down, and here's what happened. I said, boom, boom, boom. One, two, three points, and I began to do an outline. I thought, here's what I'll do, here's what I'll do, here's what I'll do. I thought, what? I want something different. They hear Blake every week, but it's going to be a lot the same, just what he said, verse by verse, line by line. I'm going to share with you what God's Word says about our great high priest. Let me read this. We'll pray, and then we'll get started. Hebrews chapter number 4. Verse number 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. I love that right there. He says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Ain't you glad of that? But was in all points tempted as we are. Men in our, in our life group this morning, we got a lot of that. Yet without Sin, separator, here's, what, here's the game changer right here. Here's the game changer. He's tempted, just like he was, just like I was, just like I am. He was tempted, game changer, yet without sin. Listen to what the Bible says. Let us therefore come boldly, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace for what? So that we can get help in our time of need. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time you've given us together. God, the opportunity, God, to stand this morning and just proclaim your word. I count it a, a great privilege, Lord, every time I get to stand. God, I know I'm not worthy <clears throat> in and of myself. 
Oh, but God, you've made me worthy through your son, Jesus Christ. And each one of us, God, that know you in the free pardon of sin, God, you've made us worthy this morning that we could stand and proclaim your word. So, God, I pray this morning that you'd speak through me. God, let your word be clear to people in this congregation this morning. God, that we might leave this place different. God, you brought us in one way. God, maybe we not go out the same way. Maybe we go out different this morning because your word has opened our eyes, God, and opened our heart and challenged us. God, this morning. So we love you. We thank you. God, what you accomplish, we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's look at this passage of Scripture this morning. Hebrews chapter number 4, verse number 14, 15, and 16. First thought I had this morning when dealing with our great high priest, and it's just straight right out of the text. Listen to what verse 14 says. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. So I thought about this. Let's look at what we have. Let's look at what we have as believers this morning. We have a great high priest. What's that mean? I've been reading. Listen to what Zodiati says. Spiro Zodiati says this right here. To the Hebrews, the priest was the person through whom and through whose ministry people could draw near to God. Because the priest, they could get close to God. In the Old Testament, that's what the Hebrews thought. That's what the people thought. They said, because of the priest, we have access to God. They were too dirty. They couldn't get there. They needed a go-between. So over in Leviticus chapter number 8, I believe it was, where they brought Aaron in, and they said, Aaron, here's what we're going to do. We're going to anoint you. You're going to be the high priest in the Old Testament. You know what the high priest was do, would do? Every year, year after year, the high priest would slip in. He would go back into the holy of holy places. Nobody else could go there. And he would make atonement. He would make a sacrifice for the sins of the people. Now here's the thing about Aaron. As good as Aaron was, and as good as Aaron tried to be, and as holy as Aaron was, and as on a pedestal as he got put up on, and as nice of robes and, and all the things that he wore, and the headbands, the turbans, and the, the diadems, and uh, go read it. We just come through it. Go read it. It's amazing. It's astonishing. When I get a picture of he would walk in, they would robe him up with a tunic. They would put a robe on him. They would put all this stuff up. They had intricate detail, these purples and, and all this fine linen and all these things. But as, as, as pure and holy and as perfect as he seemed, guess what Aaron had to do? Had to make sacrifice for his own sin. <laughs> as good as he looked, as good as he thought he was, it wasn't good enough. He had to make sacrifice for his own sins. Let me, let, me, let me say this to you, church, this morning. As good as you are, I told our life group this morning, I don't know of anybody that I can think of. You probably have somebody, and maybe it's just because it's my dad. I ain't never met nobody as good as him. I just had. I mean, I've looked around. My dad's about as good as they come. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I told him this morning, I've never heard him say really a cross word hardly to anybody. Never heard him say bad words. Maybe you have. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I hadn't. I've been watching his life. I can't think of a day that I've woke up. He ain't been in God's Word. He called me the other morning just out of the blue. I was in at work, and, and uh, I was at work, and, and I just, uh, just I seen where he called, and he called, and I said, hey, what's going on, Daddy? Because I thought, well, something's wrong. You know, Max just called me. I believe it was Max that just had called me, and I, did, I wasn't able to get to the phone. Then Daddy called, and I thought, Lord, something must be gone. Something must be wrong. They never call this in the morning like this. Oh, hey, what you doing? Here's what he said. Well, I was just sitting here sopping up some syrup and biscuit. I thought, bless God, ain't that just great? And, and, and yeah, I was just looking out the window, and he began to just tell me how good God was. Look at this beautiful sunshine. Look at what all God's done. And, and that's my dad. That's, that's, that's him. But, but I began to think about this this morning. As good as I think he is, and as good as he comes off to be, and as good as most people probably think he is, the Bible says at his very best, at my very best, I'm rotten to the core. I'm rotten to the core. I'm sinful as sinful can be. We had this discussion in life group this morning. I asked this question. You ever heard somebody say this right here? I'll never do that. You won't catch me doing that. I might sin, but I won't ever do that sin. You better be careful. Outside of the grace of God, you're capable of doing anything. Outside of God's grace, you'll fall so far you won't even be able to look up. You'll be like David. He was a man after God's own heart. He looked up. He was in a miry pit. He's an awful place. So, so Aaron, listen to this, Aaron would have to make sacrifice for, him own, for his own self. 
He was sinful. Listen, and, and here's the reality, guys. There's never enough. Never enough. L listen to what the Bible says right here. I want to show you something in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. You don't have to go there. I'll read it for you. For it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. You know why they had to come back every year? Because they kept on sinning. You know why you got to get in God's Word every single day of your life? Because you are going to keep on sinning. If you don't stay in God's Word, if you don't stay up close to the cross, if you don't stay full of God's Word, what happens is you begin to take over your own life, you begin to sit on your own throne, and you begin to make decisions for your own self, and guess what? Most of the time... They're just wrong decisions. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've sat on my throne before, and I make a mess of things. When I've come to find out, God never does. God never does. We're sinful people. We don't have a choice. Listen, and, 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 the, and the reality in the Old Testament was this right here. It was never enough. I was reading the other day, and I thought, Evie said this question at the house. The other day. She, she made this statement. She said, good Lord, that priest had a hard job. I mean, they was cutting animals up left and right. They was building fires. They was laying stuff on it. And, and here's the thing. It was never enough. It's never enough. Some of us are, are trying to get to God our own way. We think we can be good enough. We think we can give enough. We think we can do enough. We think we can be right enough. But the reality is it will never be enough. And I'm here to tell you this morning, why don't you just quit trying to do enough and start relying on the one who's already done enough. Just stop relying on yourself and start relying on the one. You ever wonder why? I just can't get victory. I just cannot get over this sin. I try and I try and I try and I try to do better and I try to do better and I try to do better, but I just never can get victory. You ever wonder why that is? You're not good enough. I'm not good enough. At my very best, I'm still not good enough. So we see it's a picture. The great high, you say, well, David, what's that got to do with our great high priest? <laughs> Listen to what the Bible says about our great high priest. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he is enough. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 through 14 says. Listen to this. But this man, I want to be, we talked about this morning, the humanity of Jesus Christ, but this man. It's important that you know the humanity of Jesus Christ. Very important that you know the humanity of Jesus Christ. But this man, after he had offered, listen to this, one sacrifice. What do we say about Aaron? The Old Testament? Year after year, day after day, offering after offering, they would come. They would come. Every time the priest would come, here would come Kenny again. Here would come Mark again. Here would come Brandon again. Here would come David again. Why? Because they fail again. They've fallen again. They've sinned again. They'll make another atonement, another sin offering, another sin offering, another sin offering. Jesus Christ came. He made one sacrifice. One. One sacrifice for sins. Listen to this word. Forever. Forever. He didn't have to come back and do it again. I got news for you. He's coming back, but it ain't going to be to do that again. <laughs> Did you know that? He is coming back, but it ain't going to be that way. That sacrifice has already been paid. And I'm here to encourage you this morning to say, listen, stop relying on your own self. Christ has already done the work. How about just resting in what he's done? How about just resting in what he's done? so broken hearted when I look at my friends and the people that I work with and the people that I, I live around and, and, I, and I'm broken hearted because I look at them and I want to say oh if something don't happen if God don't intervene in their life if, if, if they don't surrender their self to the, to the, to the, uh, the lordship of God they're going to die without him and there's no reason why anybody should ever go to hell Christ has already done everything one sacrifice for sins forever. Listen to what he did. He sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by, listen to this in verse 14. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being, I oh, love this, those who are being sanctified. 
one offering. He's perfected those who have been sanctified. What, what was he saying? Those who would believe in him, he's just working. You ever heard that old song, he's still working on me? Make me what I ought to be? <laughs> I'm not what I used to be, but thank God. I'm not what I'm going to be. He's still working on me. I mean, he is. He's, he's, he's working. He's chipping away. You ever wonder why it hurts so bad when God starts working in your life? It's because he's having to cut away some things that ain't supposed to be there. Let him. He's trying to do something through your life. Listen to this right here. John 19, 30. Jesus said this right here when he was on the cross. It is finished. It is finished. You may have one of those, band, one of those, one of those little wristbands on it says, to tell us die. You got one of those? Some of the kids got some of those. To tell us die. You know what it meant? Paid in full. The work has been completely done. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant, I've done all. All that God has asked me to do is completely paid. It's an accounting term. You know what he literally said? He said, he says, where you were broke and without hope, I've done the work. I'm going to deposit it into your account for you. You don't have to do anything. I've done it. It's done. It's finished. Are you resting in what he's done? Hey, that's the great high priest we have. That's him. That's our great high priest. So, so you think about, okay, so what do we have? What do we have in him? Listen, Jesus Christ did that for us. Nobody else could. That's why he says, let us hold fast our confession. You know what he was talking about? MacArthur said this right here. He's talking about perseverance of the saints. Let us hold fast. Too many people come to an altar. They make some profession. They get up, and, they, and you never see them again. It don't sound like perseverance to me, does it? Does it to you? Now, I'm not questioning anybody's salvation, but I'm saying this right here. And in the Christ life, have some perseverance, guys. Listen, it ain't always going to be sunshine and roses. Sometimes there's some hard days. Sometimes there's some hard times. Sometimes we just have to hold on. Sometimes we just have to say, God, I don't have any idea what you're doing, but I'm going to trust you, and I'm just going to hold fast. What's that sound like? Somebody took a hard grip, and they said, I ain't letting go. Marla asked me this question last night. She said, what do you think it meant when Jacob wrestled with God? And he said, I, you think he could have defeated God? I said, oh, of course he couldn't have won that battle. But you know what he did? Held on. He held on, knocked his hip out of socket and everything else, and he just grasped on. You know what he was saying? I ain't letting go. I'm going to hang on. Some of you are probably right there, right now, and you're at the point of just saying, well, David, I just don't understand. I just, I just don't know how it could get any worse. I'm just telling you there's some perseverance that has to be done. You have to just grip onto, the God, onto God and say, God, I'm going to trust you. You're my great high priest. I'm going to put my faith, I'm going to put my trust in you. Why? He's already done everything. He can't fail. That's why. That's what's so cool about serving God. It's what's so awesome about the God I serve. I, I watch people, and I see people in my life. I fail. People around me fail. God never does. He's never had one of those moments where he thought, well, didn't see that one coming. <laughs> He's already been there. He's already done that. Let me ask you something, guys. Think about what you do have. What do you have? I thought about that question. He says, seeing then that we have great high priest. Right there in the Bible. I ain't making it up. It's right there in the Bible. What do you have? You had a great high priest. It's not like the old priest. He's, in, he's, he's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's the great high priest. You ever wonder why they put that word great in there? Go back and read Aaron. They never called him the great high priest. They just called him the high priest. There's one coming that was going to be the great high priest, Jesus Christ. He came. Secondly, let's look at this right here. Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So we've looked at what we do have. Now let's look at what we don't have. It's amazing how God's word speaks for itself. You don't have to make anything up. We got a great high priest. Boy, so David, what, what, what don't we have? Look at it. We don't have a high priest. Listen to this who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. I looked that word sympathize up. You know what it literally meant? To have compassion on. 
here's, here's, here's how far it went. You ever, you ever have seen somebody going through some, something and you looked at them and you said, man, they're, they're, they're going through something so hard. And, and you felt sorry for them and you wanted to have compassion on them, but you just weren't going through it. Right, you, you 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 really couldn't feel what they were going through. You could you could sort of sympathize with them. You could you could say, "Man, I'm so sorry," and and I'm going to pray for you, and I love you, and I'm here for you if you need me. What what Christ was saying was this right here. What what Hebrews was saying is this right here. He has he has this kind of compassion. Listen, when you hurt, he hurts. Like this picture of of a husband and wife. They said that a man would leave his father and his mother and he would join his wife and they would become one flesh. You know what that literally means? For us men, when she's in pain, guess what? You're in pain. When I'm in pain, Marla's got to be in pain. When I'm broken, when I'm hurting, she ought to be broken and hurting. That's the kind of compassion that Christ is showing us right here. Listen, he was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. How do you know that, David? Listen to what he says right here. He says, we have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses. But listen to this. So, so, so we see that he, he has sympathy for us, right? He has sympathy for us. But, but, he, but I was reading this the other day. I want to I I say this because I wrote it down. I said I was going to say it. I was reading over in Mark chapter number 1 the other day. You don't think Jesus had bad days? In his humanity, he went through the same thing you and I went through. I, I go through every day. I was reading in Mark chapter number one the other day. It was in part of our morning reading or our, our daily Bible reading. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible said Jesus went into the synagogue. He cast out a demon out of a demon possessed man. Word began to spread. He went out. He went into Peter's, uh, Simon and Andrew's house, I think. And and his and his and when his mother in law was sick, he cast he, he healed her from a fever. And guess what happened? All these people began to bring people to him. And he began casting out devils, healing the sick, casting out devils, healing the sick, casting out devils, healing the sick. All night long, and they, they, they brought everybody to him. He said the whole city, I don't know how many that was, maybe a small city, I don't really know. I just know they brought everybody that was sick they could think of, and they said, we got to get them down there to Jesus. He's going to heal them. Verse 35, if you'll read that, you'll read it. Here's what Jesus did. You don't think he had rough days? You don't think he had long days? You think, man, I get home some days and I just think, oh, I just can't go another step. Oh, my mind's just shot. Oh, I, 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 can't, I can't listen to another phone call. I can't go through another this or that or, or, or this or that. Jesus experienced the same thing we did, but listen what he did. Verse 35 says that he rose up early the next morning. Early, before the sun even came up. And he slipped away into a solitary place. And guess what he did? Prayed. How do I handle my struggles, David? How do I handle my problems? How do I go through all these things you're talking about? Same way Jesus did. He got up early and he sought the Lord and he prayed. Why? Because he knew his day was going to be hectic. He knew he was going to have struggles. He knew he was going to go through things. He knew he was going to have phone calls. He knew he was going to have things happen in his life that he needed help with. Now Jesus could handle it. I, let me let me break the news to you. You can't. That's why sometimes when you get that phone call, you just you ever just hang up and you go. <laughs> and you want to sling the phone through the wall. You know what I'm saying? And then you kind of get a grip on things. Jesus didn't have those moments. Some of us, but he had humanity. He struggled just like we do. You and you ever wonder? And listen, guys, ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls. If you're gonna make it through this life struggles, the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows, you need Jesus in your life. Gotta have him. That's why I love so much about our church. Blake constantly preaches. He constantly talks. I constantly tell our young people. I've been so inspired over the last few weeks. There's some guys in our youth group. And there's some that ain't doing it. There's some guys. And here's what they do. Every morning they'll get up and they'll do some sort of Snapchat devotion type thing. And they're putting it out there. And I follow a lot of them on my Bible app. And, the, and, and, and probably about 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning, you say, how you know they're doing it, David? Well, I know they're at least posting it or their phone's automatically doing it, one or the other. They may have something set up where it's doing They're fooling me. I don't know. But they went through the trouble of doing it. I will say this. And it'll pop up and they'll say, so-and-so created a verse image. It'll be like 6 in the morning. I'm like, what? Come on. Thumbs up. You know what I'll do? I'll go over to that and I'll like it. And I'll say, mm, good job encourages me 
You need the Lord. You know, listen, ain't nothing wrong with reading the Bible at night. But your day's already spent. <laughs> That's why Jesus got up early. You need him in the morning. You need him in the morning. You need him at daytime. You need him at nighttime. You need him all the time. But it's so important. If Jesus had to get up and seek him early, how much more do you need to get up and seek him early? Oh, that bed feels so good, David. You ever wonder why you struggle so much? I'm just going to be honest with you. My days are so much better when I begin to start out with the Lord. So we have someone who can't, uh, so we don't have someone who can't sympathize with our weaknesses. Listen to this right here. We don't have someone who hasn't faced temptation. What do you mean, David? But was in all points tempted as we are. All points. He was tempted just like you are. You know, what, you know what's going to happen one day when you stand before the Lord? You're not going to be able to look him square in the face. You're not going to be able to say, um, you just didn't, yeah, but you don't understand, God, what I was going through. You don't understand what, what, what the temptations that I was going through. Yeah, he does. He's been there. All points, tempted, just like you are. Listen, I was reading the other day over in Mark. Funny how our Bible reading plan just walks us right through that. And it just comes right back to mind. Mark chapter number 1, I think it's verse 41, somewhere around there. It said, and he was drove out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days. Tempted of Satan for 40 days. You'll find it over in Luke chapter number 4, verses 1 through 10. Same temptation. We talked about it Wednesday night in our, in our youth downstairs. Same temptation. You say, but they don't understand what I'm going through. Same temptations. Same temptations. Look, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, they're all the same. If you look at your temptations, if you look at where you fall, if you look at where you fail, you can trace them back. The devil, listen, he ain't come up with some new scheme. It's the same. You don't know why it's always been the same? Because we're always falling for the same darn thing. I mean the same thing all the time. So we've got this sinless high priest who's been tempted. Let him walk a day in my shoes. He already has. He already did. He's been there. He's done that. He's walked it. He's been tempted. He was put to the test. Why did he do that, David? Why did he go through that, David? Because he knew what we would have to go through. He wanted to know. He wanted us to see the example. He wanted us to have an example for for us to look back and say, "Well, Christ did it, so I can do it." Yeah, but David, I'm not the Son of God. Bible tells us that all of those who would believe, He's given them the right to become what? The sons of God. The same Holy Spirit that came down, rested on Jesus Christ when He was baptized, and didn't depart. That same Holy Spirit lives inside of the believer. He lives inside of you. Don't look me in the face and say, yeah, but David, I'm going through this and I'm going through that. I'm not diminishing your struggles. I'm not diminishing your hardships. I know they're hard. Hey, trust me, we all go through them. But there's no reason why we can't say God inside of us can get us through it. He can get us through it. He will get us through it. Listen, 40 days, 40 nights, Jesus' response was always this right here. It's written, it's written, it's written. He didn't have a conversation with Satan. He didn't say, well, yeah, but I was thinking about this devil. No, 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 no. It was written. You know why most of us fail? You know why most of us fall into temptation? You know why most of us struggle and don't overcome, and don't have victorious life, don't have this victory over our sins? It's because we don't have the Word of God in our lives. That's the problem. We think, we, well, we'll just get by, and I'll listen to what Dr. Phil says, or I'll listen to what Oprah says. She, surely she can help me, or I'll, I'll listen to somebody else, or I'll pull up a devotion on my Bible app. You need the Bible. Not some devotion. Devotions are good. I'm all for it. But you need God's Word in your life. How will a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed to God's Word. You got to know it. Jesus knew it. He quoted it. He had all powers given to him, yet he quoted Scripture to defeat Satan. If he had to do it, or if he did do it, you know what I've learned to do in my time? Prayer time, quiet time, morning devotion time. You know what I've learned to do? I've learned to begin to pray Scripture. 
Blake, Blake gave us a, a bunch of papers, and, and we've sort of walked through those papers. And he said, they weren't just a bunch of papers you can stick down. It was no sweat discipleship. It's some cool stuff. It's some really good stuff that you can use. I use it every morning in my, in my personal devotion time, every morning. He gives us this, this model. We all know it, the ACTS model, A-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, right? We all know it. Here's what I've begun to do in my, in my daily uh, uh, prayer time, my adoration time. There's 31 uh, scriptures, 31 attributes of God in that stuff. Go read it. Go look at it. And on that day, here's what I'll do. I'll read it, and a lot of them will be, well, God's our comfort. God's all-powerful. God's omniscient, God's this and God's that, and it has a scripture that correlates with it. And I began, here's what I began to do. I began to pray that scripture, God, you are my comfort. God, I don't find comfort in anything else. I don't find comfort in my family. I don't find comfort in my church. I don't find comfort in my job. I don't find comfort in the stock market. Hello? I mean, if, you, if you're in that thing right there, you can see how volatile that, 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 that thing can be. Up and down, up and down. God, you are the same all the time. I'm just going to find comfort. And I begin to praise him for who he is and what he's done and where he's at and, and all of those good things. And, and I want to be honest with you guys. That's what we have. We've got somebody who has been through it. I can say, God, you've been here. You know what I'm going to face. You know what I'm going through. Wouldn't it be sad to have a God sitting up on his throne who has no clue what sin is like? I've created humanity. I've stuck them down there and I've said, good luck getting to me because you can't. I know. He's given us a great high priest who can sympathize, who can know where we're tempted. That gives me great comfort to know that he came to me. I say this all the time. David Platt said it in his book. I believe it's radical. He said he was at a, at a, at a meeting some time, some time ago, and it's been a long time ago, actually. It was world leaders or, or religious leaders were all around, all different kinds of religions. One said, well, I'm trying to get to God on this side, and the other one said, I'm trying to get to God on this side, and one said, well, we're trying to get to God on this side, and they all looked at one another and said, Phew. Basically the same. We're all just trying to get to God. No matter what kind of religion, what it is. Here's what Platt said. He said, guys, what if I told you God come down to where you were? That's the game changer right there. How about God come to where you were? So we see what we do have. We see what we don't have. Look at the next statement. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Look at what we have access to. I'm convinced in most believers' lives we don't realize what kind of power we have access to. How do you know that, David? How do you believe? How do you, how can you say that? I look at lives all around. Now I'm not preaching health, wealth, prosperity, and prosperity and all this that. I'm not preaching that. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, we've got a power. What do you mean, David? He said, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we what? May obtain mercy. And that we might be able to find help in our time of need. Did you know in the Old Testament, Aaron was the only one that could go back there. He's the only one. Nobody else could. I was, I was thinking the other day, you don't think God's serious about sin? Go read Leviticus chapter number 9. Me and Evie was reading it the other day. Aaron's two sons offered strange fire on the altar. Consumed them. Maybe that was the high priest's son. Yeah, two of them. Two of them. Listen. Here's what Jesus did for us. He gave us access to his throne. Let me give you this example and I'm done. I want to leave, leave with this note right here. You say, David, so, so we have access to this throne of grace. I thought, what's a good picture of this throne of grace? You know where my mind went? Back to the book of Esther. My mind went right back to the book of Esther. 
A lot of times in the, in the ancient world, they would have these great throne rooms, and the kings would sit on their thrones, and, and listen to me. You didn't just waltz in there. You didn't just breeze up into the throne room. The king sitting on his throne and his feet sitting on a, on a footstool and him sitting up high and mighty. And you just walk up, waltz up in there and be like, hey, king, I need this. You want to know why? They'd execute you on the spot. You'd be gone. And my mind went back to Esther. God had placed her in a position. She was, uh, she was the queen. Esther had to, had to do, she had to make a choice. If you go back and read the book of Esther, I'm sure, I'm sure you all have. I'm going to read the book of Esther. She had to make a choice. Mordecai, I believe it was, that said, maybe God's put you here for such a time as this. And here's what she said. I'll go into the king. She wasn't summoned to go into the king. Nobody called her. The king didn't just say, hey, bring Esther in here. She had to decide, okay, I'm going to go before the king I, because, because what, what needed to be done. I'm going somewhere with this. She, she knew that if the king didn't show her favor, she was a goner. She didn't have access. She didn't have just open door to the king. Jesus Christ came. And the Bible says that that veil, that tent that separated us from God. See, see he was too holy. We were too sinful. We couldn't get in there. Had you got in there, you'd have been dead on the spot. Had you slipped back there, you'd have been gone. Here's what Jesus Christ done. He came and he opened up that access. And here's what the book of Hebrews says. Because Jesus is our great high priest. One who sympathizes with us. One who can, who's been tempted like we are. He's opened up access and now we can come boldly before the throne of grace that we might be able. I don't have to come in there all scared and all worried. Listen, I'm in awe of God. I have a reverential fear of God. He's God. I know who I am. I know who He is. But I, I'm telling you, I have access to come into the throne of God. And I can come boldly before Him and I can say, God, I need help. A place that I don't deserve to be. A place that I never deserve to be. Jesus has made a way so that we can get there. And I wonder, let me ask you something. How many of you today, how many of you today are even, even praying at all? You have access to the very throne room of God. And we spend so little time We'll watch a Braves game for hours, won't we, Brother Duell? We will. I mean, Braves are fixing to kick off, and I'll have them on TV as much as possible. So little time. So little time. Here's the sad thing. We're running around. We're trying our best to find help. Where do I turn? Never seen a day in my life. There's so much anxiety, so much uncertainty, so much worry, so much stress. Turn the news on for just a couple of minutes. It'll break your heart. Marla has a bad habit every morning when she wakes up. She'll flip the TV on, turn it to Channel 11, I believe it does, and, and, and just to see what's going on, see what the news is, see what kind of weather is going on, just see what's happening. And I can hear it before I walk out of the door. Da, da, da. And it's the, it's the morning show. Come on. And headlines this right here. Widespread panic. Coronavirus. We don't know where it come from. So-and-so's killed somebody. This one's died. Stock markets took a dive. Another 10 points. Another 100 points or whatever it is. And it's always just all this stuff. And we're looking to all these things for help. And I'm saying to you this morning, Jesus Christ, on, on his authority this morning, he's given you access as a child of God to come into the very throne room. Where can I get help, David? The throne room of God. You don't need me to go there for you. You don't need your life group teacher to go there for you. You don't need the pastor to go there for you. You don't need your mom, your dad to go there for you. You can come boldly before the throne of grace this morning.
As David comes with a verse of invitation, I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what you're going through this morning. And I hope I've said something that might, would help you or encourage you. I know it wasn't nothing mind-blowing. It wasn't nothing that you hadn't heard before. But maybe you just needed to be said again. Hey, maybe you're in this room this morning. You say, I don't even know this great high priest, David. I've never come to a place in my life where I've come to the end of who I am, surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, and accepted his sacrifice for salvation. Maybe you're that person in this room. Hey, I wouldn't be uh, doing you a justice this morning if I didn't give you an opportunity to respond. But maybe you're, maybe you're struggling this morning. Maybe you've been tempted. Maybe you're, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're going through a hard time. This morning, I, I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of people in this room, with a lot of different things. Whatever you need to do, I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. Hey, I'm going to give you an opportunity to go. You don't have to come here to get into the throne room and do it right where you sit. But boy, here's a good place. It's a good place. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time you've given us together. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. God, there are those that are in this room. God, I don't know who they are. God, I don't know their situation. God, I don't know their struggles. Oh, but God, I'm so comforted from your word. God, to realize that, God, you are our great high priest. God, you're on your throne, God, and we can come. God, knowing, God, that you've been, you've been through the struggles. And God, you've given us access to come boldly before your throne of grace. God, maybe there's someone in this room that needs help this morning. God, may today be the day they come to get, get that help they need. So God, have your will and way in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet. One.